is the ninth of the Joint Access Computer Science Seminar Series. We are very pleased to have Professor Andreas Molich from University of Southern California today as our speaker. He is the former Colon Andrew and Erna Vitorvice Professor at USC. He was previously at Technical University of Vienna, AT&T Bell Labs, Lund University, and Mitsubishi Electric Research Labs. His research interests are mainly in wireless communications, specifically on wireless propagation channels, multi-antenna systems, ultra-wideband <coughs> signaling and localization, neural modulation methods, and caching for wireless output distribution, which is the topic of today's talk. He is the author of four books, um, 19 book chapters, more than 240 journal papers, 320 conference papers, as well as 80 patents. He is a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors, IEEE, AAAS, and IET, as well as a member of Australian <coughs> Academy of Sciences, and he is the recipient of many awards. Let's give him a warm UI, UCI welcome. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction and thanks for inviting me uh, to come here and uh, give this talk today. So I uh, hope to give you a little bit of an insight into our activities in caching for wireless video, uh, why that is important and what are some possibilities of improving the throughput in a future 5G networks. So let's start out with the motivation. Why are we looking at the problem of increasing throughput in wireless networks, in particular for video. Uh, so the answer is that the absolute amount as well as the percentage of video in overall cellular traffic has been increasing for a number of years and is, uh, is going to continue to increase. So if you're looking at the Cisco uh, wireless network index, you'll find that, uh, well, right now, video already is more than 50% of all the traffic is going to go up to about 80% uh, and it's really going to strain the network as we know it. And actually our own work on this topic started in 2011, I uh, want to give uh, credit here to, uh, to Intel, uh, that uh, put out a call for proposals saying, well, how can we improve video throughput by at least a factor of 1000? And that seemed like a, a, fairly, a fairly steep challenge. So the question is, what can we do to, uh, to really solve this uh, situation? Because if you're a network operator nowadays, you have a couple of, uh, I would almost say, standard ways of improving your throughput for any type of file. Right? You can buy more spectrum. But if you realize that typically 10 megahertz of spectrum nationwide could uh, cost a billion dollars and, uh, and more, then you realize that that might not necessarily be a scalable solution. And sooner or later, you're pretty much limited in how much uh, spectrum is there still available. Um, of course, it's now with millimeter wave communication gets a little bit easier because there is all these uh, 10, 15 gigabit uh, sorry, gigahertz of bandwidth available in the millimeter wave bands, but uh, that also has some limitations in particular that for millimeter wave cellular communications, your cell radius is pretty much limited to somewhere between 100 and, uh, and 200 meter, uh, practically speaking. So deployment of these base stations is, of course, expensive already, and the most important question is, even if I have this very dense network of base stations, how do I actually haul back the information? <laughs> Laying a fiber to points uh, on the street every 100 meter is in itself an extremely uh, costly endeavor. Of course, you can think about, well, let's uh, look at wireless backhauls and so on, and uh, there are a lot of uh, smart people in the industry looking at exactly this question right now, but there's still that issue of uh, scalability. We can look at uh, just improving the efficiency of the physical layer and that is uh, what wireless research has been about for the past uh, 30 years. Right? But uh, at least from a single link point of view, uh, today's systems are pretty much at capacity. 
we have uh, uh, OFDM, which we know is information theoretically optimum, with capacity achieving codes, and so on. So single link is, is more or less uh, at capacity. Now, from a network point of view, of course, we can still make a lot of important improvements. But again, there is some limitations of uh, what can be achieved. So um, when we were looking at this problem, as I said, for the first time about uh, eight, nine years ago, we were thinking, well, is there something about video that makes it fundamentally different from the other contents that are out there on the web? And the short answer is yes. Video is very much uh, with a concentrated popularity <coughs> distribution. So in other words, a relatively small number of video files account for the majority of all the web traffic. Right? All I need to say is Game of Thrones. <laughs> Last Monday, half of all the web traffic, I'm pulling the number out of my sleeve now, was people watching Game of Thrones. So that brings us, however, now to the question of, well, can we make this more efficient? Because right now, every time you click on HBO now and st start to stream this, uh, then you are uh, actually initiating a unicast transmission from the wireless network. And so if somebody <laughs> next to you clicks on the same app and watches the same video three minutes later, it's another unicast stream. So you're using up twice the spectral resources, which seems like a terribly inefficient way of doing it. What can we do in a better way? Well, people had one idea a hundred years ago, which was broadcast the thing. And you only have one transmission for a million viewers in the greater Los Angeles area. But of course, that requires that everybody's watching synchronously, which is, again, not something that you would uh, necessarily want to impose on people. That's the, the new trend in all of entertainment, right? We want to watch things when we want, not when the network uh, provider or the content provider says that now you are allowed to, uh, to watch it. So the question is, is there a way of exploiting video popularity while retaining on-demand capability? And the answer is yes. And this is a really, uh, I would almost call it the central slide of this talk because it gives you in uh, some fairly straightforward steps, the, the whole principle of what we are talking about. So the first one is to say bandwidth is, is expensive, storage is cheap, so is there some way of converting memory that we have on our wireless devices into bandwidth? Second line of thought, content popularity is concentrated, but the requests for contents are coming at different times, so we need to cache our files uh, somewhere in, our, in the memory of our devices to reduce the number of unicast transmissions, or in other words, to, uh, to increase the, uh, the bandwidth uh, consumption. And the third line of thought is the memory has to be close to the user. And now one obvious solution you could jump to is saying, well, let me just cache the content that I want to watch on my device during the night, let's say, again, Game of Thrones, HBO just, just does a broadcast during the night to everybody who has their app and uh, says, well, we anticipate that tomorrow during the day you will want to watch this particular uh, show, so let's broadcast it during the night and it's cached on your device and then you can watch it at whatever time you want. And that's a great idea, that helps us certainly and if you're looking, it's actually implemented in some services like uh, Netflix uh, Smart Download. Netflix anticipates what you'll want to watch. It's going to store it already on your Netflix app on your phone. And then if you, uh, if you want to watch it, it uh, just goes directly from your memory. It doesn't have to go to a wireless uh, link. However, while we have something like uh, maybe 30 gigabyte of, uh, of RAM on our devices, that's not enough to store all the files that we want to watch. So the key idea now is to say, let's use the storage of surrounding devices in order to create a, what we call a super cache. And then 
we essentially say, okay, the phones of everybody who are in this room here uh, constitute this super cache and will try to store files in such a way that everything that everybody uh, is in this room is interested in is stored somewhere in this room. Right? Why is that more efficient than everybody watching their own stuff? Well, because there are certain files that we can anticipate everybody will want to watch. But why would we have to store Game of Thrones on every single cache here if it's enough to have it only on one or two devices? Okay, so then what happens if I want to watch it, but it's actually uh, you who have it, uh, have it stored on your device? Well, now we are setting up a device-to-device -device communication link and uh, communicate this file over a very short distance to the user who's actually requesting it to me. So again, you might be saying, why is this better than just streaming it for, uh, unicast from the base station? Because again, there is one wireless transmission involved in the whole thing. So why is, is this communication better than getting it from the base station? Well, there you have to look at the concept of area spectral efficiency in cellular communications. If we are talking to each other over a three meter distance, then it means somebody else who's 10 meters away can reuse the same spectral resource, the same time frequency resource, uh, again. Whereas if I get this from the base station, then it means that frequency is now blocked for everybody within a 500 meter radius. And so that basically tells us if as a network operator, I have a certain amount of spectrum uh, for me, then I can either sustain a thousand device-to-device -device links or one cellular link. Well, guess which one I would prefer here. Right? So that is the, uh, the key idea of the device-to-device uh, the -device communication supported caching. We're saying we're creating a group of users that are sort of pooling their caches and uh, therefore are able to create every, uh, or to store every file that everybody in that pool might be interested in, and then they use device-to-device -device communication in order to, uh, to exchange the files. And let me stress again, why is this better, uh, or why uh, might the pool be sufficient to store all the files? Well, the number of files that we as a group here are interested in is not n times the number of files that each person is interested in. As we have constant overlap, I might be interested in 10 particular files, but then uh, you might be interested in also 10 files, but eight of them have an overlap with the files that I'm interested in. You might be interested in uh, 10 other files that have now some overlap with what I'm interested in, what you're interested in, and so therefore, as we're looking at the number of files we're interested in as a number of users, it's actually, uh, it's, it's flattening out. And that is the reason really why for a big pool is able to cache all the files that everybody is, is interested in, even if each individual device is not able to cache all the files that the individual is interested in. Did you have a question? So you're wondering, how do, how do we make sure that, that, that there is content overlap in the, in the last 10 meters? Uh, that is essentially uh, by, by design. So we'll, uh, I'll discuss later on uh, of uh, the deterministic as well as random caching uh, strategy. But I mean, we can anticipate uh, just from general, uh, general user behavior that there is l overlap between interests for every group of people that are coming together. Right? That's, that's just the very nature of uh, the fact that some videos are popular and, uh, and others are not. And then to, to make sure that we, uh, that we have these popular files actually stored at least once in our group, we have to design a suitable uh, caching strategy that uh, essentially now says, okay, how big is uh, our group going to be, our pool? And so therefore, what is it that each of the users in the pool should actually be caching? 
There's another question. Yeah. Is this an uh, <coughs> application layer solution or uh, layers below? It's really a cross layer uh, solution. I mean, it, it requires everything from a, uh, from a good physical layer in order to do your your device to device communication in the correct way, uh, to going up to the application layer of, of saying, well, who's actually going to uh, to cache uh, what files and what are, what are the demands are going to be. You can even think about shaping demand by saying that uh, from a network operator perspective, that well, if you're willing to watch the video that is available at a cheap wireless cost, then we're going to charge you less than, uh, than if, you, if you're using a video that, uh, is, that is, uh, has to be streamed from the base station. But we see some, uh, some indications of that uh, even nowadays that uh, certain, uh, certain video providers, uh, for example, T-Mobile uh, Binge, uh, if you're Using certain uh, certain video providers that are pre-coding their uh, their video files in a way that makes them spectrally efficient, then it's not going to cost again. Uh, it's not going to count against your uh, your monthly uh, data budget. And so, uh, and that now has implications all the way down to the physical layer because it shapes the popularity distribution. It determines of what is the uh, what is the data rate you need for your physical layer link and so on. So you can't really just assign it to one particular. Okay, so let me now go uh, to what you can expect in the rest uh, <coughs> residual 30 minutes, I guess, or, uh, or so. So I'm going to expound a little bit on the operating principle. You've got the, the basic idea now. I'm going to go into a little bit more details. They're going to tell you about the information the theoretic limits of the performance. And then I'm going to look about at the energy efficiency and talk about more details about popularity distribution, some fairly recent results that we obtained here, and some specific implementation aspects uh, that might be relevant here as well. So here is again just the statement that uh, videos with different uh, <coughs> Oh, sorry, different videos just have different uh, popularities. And the standard way of how request distribution or popularity distribution is modeled is the ZIF distribution, which is essentially just a discretized uh, exponential. Right? And uh, that had been established um, almost 20 years ago from a number of YouTube videos on a, uh, on a wired network. Um, our most recent investigations show that actually a generalization of that, the MZIF distribution, seems to fit better for the uh, for cellular data. But a lot of the stuff that I'm going to present today is actually based on the ZIF distribution, not only because it is a quite useful and uh, practically relevant distribution, but also because it makes the theoretical treatment quite a bit easier, right? You have got a single parameter distribution characterized really only by this parameter uh, gamma r. And essentially, the larger the gamma, the more concentrated your request distribution is. And uh, you can imagine the more efficient is this whole caching scheme uh, going to be. Uh, we already know now that the, uh, the efficiency of the scheme relies on content reuse, so if the more concentrated my popularity is, the better it is for, uh, uh, for my scheme. And we will also see that depending on whether gamma is larger or smaller than one, uh, we have a different mathematical uh, behavior that really mostly has to do with how this, uh, how this series here converges. So, again, uh, saying what I said before in slightly different words. Um, we know that a lot of smartphones and tablets have significant storage capabilities, uh, 32, 64, 128, and even more in the most recent devices, uh, I mean, a gigabyte is available. And we have enough 
storage space to store some files that are of interest to the, uh, to the user, but not all of them. Right? The typical file, uh, video file that you might want to cache is somewhere on the order of 500 uh, megabyte. So if you're setting aside, let's say, 10, uh, 10 or 20 uh, gigabyte of your, of your storage space on your device, then, well, it's not going to cover everything that you might want to watch. So the efficiency in the communication, device to device communication, is created by having now these uh, multiple links in parallel, which are possible because each of them is very short uh, connection. I think you can basically imagine uh, the, the protocol model that I say, if I'm communicating with somebody who's three meters away from me, then I'm creating an interference bubble around me, let's say a radius of uh, two meter or four meter, whatever threshold we want, we want to set here, and nobody else can receive other information who happens to be in that radius. But somebody who's more than that away, they can set up their own communication with, uh, with another receiver. And so that's how we're getting these multiple parallel links. And uh, we can simplify our physical layer consideration with the following model. We're saying we're dividing all the users in a, uh, in a larger area into a bunch of clusters. And now uh, users within the cluster can freely communicate with each other. So I'm basically just setting up a maximum communication radius for each of the users. And so if I'm here at this corner, I can talk to somebody who's in the, on the other end of the cluster, but I can't communicate across the cluster. And so somebody else who's communicating here, again, can communicate with somebody in that same cluster, but, uh, but not across, and so on. And I can also take measures that the, the, that the transmissions in the different clusters don't interfere with each other, can be just a, a regular frequency we use here. And so, the quantity that determines now my overall system design is how do I pick this cluster size? And we want to optimize that, and that optimization will ultimately lead us also to, to these information theoretic uh, limits. Because there is obviously a trade-off involved here. If I make my cluster too small, then the chances are low that I actually find the file that I, uh, that I want to see. Right? If my cluster is so, uh, so small that there is only one other person in that cluster, one other user, then our aggregate cache is only twice the, uh, the, the size of a single user cache. And that's probably not enough to store all the desired devices. So I will have uh, a very high outlet. I might have to go again to getting my file from the, uh, from the base station because I can't find it in my uh, device, <coughs> device communication part. On the other hand, if I make my cluster too large and I just say, okay, I'm going to communicate with everybody in a 500 meter radius, then I haven't really gained anything compared to just getting my files from the base station. Right? Because then again, I can only have a single link in a 500 meter radius. So again, I have not improved my, uh, my overall performance. So the key question is, how do I actually optimize my cluster size and what is the throughput that I can achieve under those uh, circumstances. Are you assuming a geographical <coughs> distribution of the users, maybe uniform? Yes, uh, a very good question. Uh, exactly. I assume that I have a uniform di uh, distribution of my users. In some of our work, we actually assume that, we, uh, that the users are on a regular grid, um, which is really just for, for mathematical convenience. In a lot of our other investigations, we assume the homogeneous Poisson point process. So what is the motivation for the people that own the smartphone to you know, do, the, do this? Because they're actually you know, um, how to say, uh, using up their energy and also their storage space to actually help the network to you know, reduce bandwidth size. So how do you, you know, how does, um, that, that's, a, uh, that's a very good uh, question also, and one that, I've, uh, that we've been, have been asked a, a lot. I actually have a slide on that later on, but let me 
jump to it uh, right away. Um, the first one is it could be just based on a token principle of saying uh, one hand washes the other. So like in any peer-to-peer -peer, uh, system, um, Napster or whatever principles uh, there are, basically the same problem arises. Right? It doesn't matter whether, uh, whether it's wireless or not. Why, why do I use up my bandwidth to let somebody else uh, stream uh, movies from the computer that, uh, that are cached on, uh, on my device? And uh, so it could be just an arrangement between the users of saying, well, it's token-based and I allow uh, my, uh, my cache to be used in order to get more tokens so that later on I can use that, uh, that cache, uh, sorry, that, uh, that bandwidth uh, myself. There would also be the possibility for network operators to actually incentivize this, uh, this type of communication. Now, for the network operators, this scheme is very good because whatever the users get from each other through device-to-device -device communications, they don't need to strain the base station links in order to, to get them. And so the network operator could easily say that, well, we are not counting what you're getting through device-to-device -device for your monthly data allotment. And so it, either of those approaches could motivate people. Now, when we're talking about the, the, the tokens or even network operators, we, of course, have to keep in mind um, not all usages are equivalent. As it's, uh, it's a question of the peak time, and it's also a question of what is my remaining battery status. Uh, we actually had some uh, work a year or two ago with, uh, with Behind University on looking at how do we make sure that we are not using up our last 10% of battery in, in order to stream a movie to, uh, to somebody in the vicinity. So there, there has to be some form of weighing of the, uh, of the token and just an opting out of the user saying, okay, I have not enough battery anymore. I'm out of the pool of, uh, of users who, who might come. So I mentioned one of the optimization tasks that we need to do is what is actually the best cluster size. Now another optimization task is what is actually the files that we should store on the users in a particular cache. And there are two fundamental ways of dealing with that. One is what I would call a central caching. So if last night as a network operator I would have known already all the, uh, the IDs of all the people who are going to be here in this room, then of course I can say, um, you please store these files. You uh, store these files, you store these files. It's all uh, uh, non-overlapping sets. And as a sum of users in this environment here now, we have the maximum number of files uh, stored that we, uh, that we might be using. Right? That, that's a deterministic caching scheme. We want no overlap between the cache content of each of the users. And this is also quite, uh, quite neat for theoretical purposes because it always gives us an upper bound of, uh, of what we can achieve. And obviously, what are the files that we want this super cache then to contain? Well, the most popular ones overall. Now, it is not realistic to say, I will know who's going to be in a cluster the next day. Right? We, uh, we are all somewhat unpredictable. So instead, we're saying every user caches files in a randomized way on their own. And because it's random, we have a relatively small likelihood that everybody just happened to cache the same stuff. Right? There will be some overlap, but it's not going to be catastrophic. And so the question we now have to ask is, what is that randomized caching distribution that gives us the best results in terms of throughput uh, when, uh, when we are ultimately going uh, to the exchange thing? So this is something that is much easier to implement. Some users may cache the same files. But as we will see in a, uh, in a second, it's actually <coughs> not that much of a performance difference. And uh, you can actually show that asymptotically speaking, I had some interesting discussion with uh, Professor Medar also about that uh, recently. Uh, asymptotically speaking, you can actually show that you're getting the same performance. Now, in a realistic setup, 
No, it's not uh, exactly the same, but it's pretty close. And so that essentially allows you to, uh, to say, well, let's, uh, let's do our randomized caching. We're getting maybe a few for difference of 10 uh, or 15 percent. But uh, fundamentally speaking, we're going to be as good as if we just had this deterministic approach. By the way, the selfish caching of everybody just saying, I'm going to store the files that I am most likely to watch tomorrow, that uh, from a, uh, how shall we say, social point of view is a very bad strategy. So you can actually find in closed form what is the optimum caching distribution. This GC here is actually the, uh, the cluster size. Uh, M is the size of our, uh, of our library. And long story short, this is essentially uh, some kind of water filling distribution. So you say you're storing popular files up to a certain cutoff level M star. And within that, that range, uh, ordered file index from 1 to M star, you store randomized. And the most popular file, the probability of storing a very popular file is actually a little bit higher than the probability of requesting a popular file. So you're getting something uh, as a caching distribution that is a little bit even more skewed than your request distribution. And as I said, the really unlikely files they are not, uh, not cached at all. There's this water filling cutoff that basically says beyond that uh, level, you're not, uh, not caching anything at all. So we've now established how do we cache. We've established that we need to optimize our cluster size. Now the question is, what do we gain? Because if we, overall we would say we're going through all of these troubles and then we're gaining a factor of two in the video throughput, then that's probably not worth all the, uh, all the trouble. The nice thing that we can show is that you actually get an order gain and give you the, uh, the, the punchline right at the start. Um, the throughput per user in a unicast system, of course, goes down as one over the number of users. And if you have, uh, if you're unicast, you have 10 megahertz of, uh, of bandwidth, and you have 10 times as many users, you have to divide your bandwidth into 10 times as many, uh, as many slots, and uh, therefore, the throughput for each user is going to, uh, to go down, obviously. The kicker now with this device-to-device uh, -device enabled caching is that the throughput per user stays constant. So you're getting an really what we call an order gain in your scaling law that as you ramp up the density of your users, for example, in a cellular environment, that you're uh, getting a factor of 10, a factor of 100, theoretically even more, as you increase the, uh, the number of your users in your system. That is, by the way, four, uh, four particular uh, limits on the, uh, on the gamma factor in the, in the request uh, distribution. Now, throughput might not be the only criterion that, uh, that you are interested in. Because imagine a system in which I have one very popular file and the rest is, is maybe not quite as popular. Well, as my number of users increases, um, by just always concentrating on this one uh, popular file, I can, of course, get my throughput to be very, very high. And that's, uh, that's not really the, uh, the problem. But what happens in that case, then, is that the outage is also becoming very large. That the number of files that I actually still have to get from my base station goes up uh, just as strongly as my, as my throughput uh, goes up. And therefore, the load on the base station and uh, so the, uh, the effort that I as a network operator have to make is still uh, beyond what is reasonable. 
So what I therefore would like is to establish a certain threshold for the outlet, saying no more than this uh, threshold of files is allowed to be in outlet. And given that constraint, what then is the throughput that I can achieve? So that's what we're calling the throughput outlet trade-off. And uh, as we are now looking at the, uh, at the limiting regime, so uh, we're saying n being the number of users, m being the number of uh, files, and capital M is the number of uh, files that I can store on one particular device. And so it's just my, my cache size normalized by the, uh, by the file size. Then I can say my throughput follows the, uh, the order of the maximum of capital M over M and one over uh, one over M. And I'm not going to go into the details of this uh, of this theorem here. That in itself would be, I think, at least one uh, one lecture to uh, to handle this. But it it basically just tells you that we have to look at different regimes in our analysis which uh, depend partly on what is our outage, uh, uh, outage level P and what is our uh, request uh, skew factor in the zip distribution, the, uh, the gamma R. But depending on that, you are actually getting a little bit different results for the achievable throughput outage trade-off. And actually, let me skip over this. And I'm going to show you some numerical results in a second. Now, remarkably, while we were working on this, there was uh, another group at, uh, at Bell Labs also working on the question of uh, video. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mada Ali and, uh, and Neeson. And they were looking at a scheme that is called a coded multicast, where uh, you are essentially saying that you store certain parts of files on the caches of the different users, but it's not enough that you can actually reconstruct those, uh, those files by yourself. And so it's not the, day, the scheme of, oh, I selfishly just, uh, just store the, the files for me that I will want to watch, but I'm, I'm storing fractions of this stuff. And then later on, the base station is performing a broadcast of essentially a linear combination of files that are that all the different users in the environment are interested in. And with that additional information, now it's possible for each of the users to reconstruct the files that they are interested in. And very remarkably, <coughs> this scheme provides exactly the same order law for the throughput. Completely different idea, exactly the same result. That was, uh, that was quite interesting to, uh, uh, to see. And I will come in a second to the question of, well, can we actually combine the, the results? Now, if we are looking at the uh, at throughput results in actual practical environments, However, we do notice that there is some, uh, some differences here. But before going to that, let me just look at the overall performance of device-to-device -device communication actually at a, uh, at, a, at a Wi-Fi frequency. You see here the outage probability plotted and uh, the throughput per user. And we see that for conventional unicasting, we're somewhere on the order between 10 to the 2 and 10 to, uh, 10 to the 3 are depending on our outage probability. And for device-to-device -device communication, we are pretty much between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 6. So we are getting uh, definitely orders of magnitude gain, uh, uh, more than a factor of, uh, of 100 for sure. And you see here that this also works with relatively low outage probabilities, but we frankly practice outage probabilities beyond 10 to the power of minus 3 and so on are probably not that interesting. So it's really this regime here that we mostly want to watch. Um, by the way, this is uh, 
based on a zip popularity distribution. I mentioned before that in practice uh, the distribution can be somewhat different, uh, like mzip. This here is equivalent results when we're looking at measured popularity distribution from a big measurement campaign in the, in the UK that we had access to. And as you can see here, that the results are still, and so it only shows uh, the, the comparison now here between unicast and the blue curve and the uh, device, uh, the device communication. And so depending on the size of your cache, you still get your uh, two orders of magnitude improvement. So even uh, if you're saying, well, does this hold with realistic caching distribution, um, essentially, yes. Now let's look at this comparison here between device-to-device -device communication and coded multicast. And we see device to device gives us higher throughput. And we might wonder why, because we just showed information theoretically that they give us the same, uh, the same basic laws. Well, the thing is, the scaling law is indeed the same. However, when we're now looking at the practical channel implications, what is the, uh, the problem always with broadcast? Well, broadcast is limited by the weakest user in the cell. And if I've got one cell edge user that is uh, stuck in a fading dip, then th that user might not be getting actually the communication from the base station at a sufficient rate in order to, uh, to do all, it, uh, all its decoding. For device-to-device -device communication, because we're inherently at a close uh, range of communications, uh, that, uh, that issue doesn't really occur very much. And uh, because we have multiple possible links within cluster and we can basically get over fading by just waiting until we are out of a shadowing gift and so on we have a fundamentally more robust behavior uh, here these are by the way simulations with uh, fairly realistic channel models uh, 3dpp channel models uh, for, for all of the things now the question obviously arises if we're combining device to device communication with coded multicast um, can we actually go beyond that scaling law that I was uh, showing before? And the short answer to that is no. The fundamental principle of coded multicast and device to device are just two opposite to each other. I think coded multicast, um, I want to have a wide distribution of my content. In device to device, I want to be as short range as possible. And the two things just don't mesh together. So we, uh, we actually looked at this at, at a combination scheme where you're broadcasting uh, within each cluster, and the thing is you are not getting an improvement in the throughput. Uh, what does allow you to improve the scaling law is if you're saying instead of just communicating within each cluster, now you're allowing multi hub Because now you can have, uh, you can shrink your cluster size and if you can't find a file within your cluster, then you're just initiating a multi-hub communication and you're getting it from a, a, from a different part of the, uh, of the network. So let me summarize what we discussed up to now, which was essentially caching and help in base station controlled device to device communications can improve the uh, video throughput. So we are really getting a change in the scaling law. The performance obviously depends very much on the reuse factor of, uh, of our video content. This clustering approach that I said allows a very simple theoretical analysis and optimization of the communication size. And the uh, deterministic and random file assignment work fairly much the same. Now, I realize I'm way beyond the time that I had anticipated. So I'm just gonna uh, pick out one particular uh, topic now that I think might be, uh, might be of interest to you and I'm gonna spend three minutes on it. Um, if you're more interested in these other topics, I'll be happy to, uh, to discuss with you. Also, I, I received the question about the, uh, about the slides. I just need to do a couple of uh, editions of copyright notices for IEEE because most of the figures are taken from our uh, transaction papers, but I, I will make the slides available uh, uh, sometime early next week. So let me jump to the question of popularity distribution. And the first question is, 
we always used the zip distribution up to now. So is that really what we are using in practice, or, or what we see in the practice from user demand? And so the first answer is no. This uh, dashed curve here is a measured result that we got from a big campaign in of our data from the BBC iPlayer, which is the biggest video service in the UK. And uh, you can see here that it's actually not a straight line, but it's sort of flat until here, and then it has a break point, and then it goes down more or less exponentially. So this can be modeled by a zip mandelberg distribution. And depending on this Q, uh, Q factor, you're getting, uh, which is essentially where you have the break point, you get a little bit different behavior of your actual throughput. But importantly, the scaling laws do not change. So that's something we've just established uh, like a couple of months ago. But the more important question is, we assume up to now that every user is following the same request distribution. Right? We said we have zips distribution with the gamma r, and I pick the files that I want according to that uh, gamma r, or it describes what I want to watch, it describes what you want to watch, it describes what you want to watch, and so on. And we know that's not really the case. Right? Different people have different preferences. I like to watch ballroom dancing competitions. I don't think that every single person in this room here would have the exact same uh, preference for, uh, for watching uh, YouTube videos. Right? So um, therefore, we really have to say different people have different uh, popularity preferences. And that fact actually impacts to a great deal how we should be designing our caching system. Um, by the way, it is different from looking at the Netflix model where we say, well, what are the individual user preferences and what should I pre-cache? Here we are looking at the statistics of the individual user distribution. So that's, that's a very different uh, matter. <coughs> and without going here too much into the details, we can basically say we extracted the user preferences from these uh, data of the BBC iPlayer, which essentially goes in two steps. We're saying, what are the preferences of the genres that we want to watch? Right? Uh, crime uh, movies, sports movies, uh, documentaries, and so on. Different people have different preferences for this. One person might only watch soap operas, one, another person might only watch uh, sports videos. Right? And then within those genres, we can again model what is the popularity of the individual users in that genre. And that gives us, uh, we, we fitted the, the results uh, statistically based on proper bladder distances, again, jumping. This is the basic flow diagram of how do you generate individual user requests based on that particular model. Um, I always call these sort of things the, uh, the shock slides because obviously nobody is ever gonna, uh, gonna read uh, through it. But important information is here at the bottom. If you actually need these individual user distributions, you can go to our website, you can download the MATLAB code. It's already parameterized based on the measurements in the UK. And uh, you can basically just apply that in the in your computation. And uh, here is just a confirmation that this basically gives a pretty good agreement with real world data. <coughs> so I think looking at the time, I'm just going to come here to the main conclusions. We can, uh, I didn't discuss this at all, but um, <laughs> Of course, throughput and outage are not the only criteria we're, we're interested in. Energy efficiency is a big factor. And uh, we can look at optimization of the corporation distance that we, uh, that we mentioned before, not just for throughput, but for energy efficiency as well. Um, we said that the information of individual user preferences can definitely improve the overall uh, performance. The, Measurement-based models for the individual popularity distributions are available. As I said, with a, uh, you can just uh, download the code, essentially. And 
we found that in practice, even with these measured distributions, not with the idealized uh, ZIPS distributions, the performance <coughs> advantages of these uh, device-to-device -device, uh, communication-based caching systems are really quite pronounced. Now, I obviously, this is not work that, that was done on my own. This, uh, it all started out with uh, a project with Professor Kaiwe, now in Berlin, and Professor Dimak is now, uh, now in Texas. Uh, we've cooperated with a number of other people, in particular recently Professor Shastri from, uh, from London for the uh, popularity distributions. A number of uh, former PhD students uh, have also been instrumental in getting all the results. And as I said, if you have any further questions, please feel free to uh, ask me now or uh, send me an email. And there are a bunch of papers that are related to this topic that, of course, contain all the gory details of the derivations. OK, let's thank the speaker. Password for today is wireless, all small <laughs> letters. Any questions? Uh, most of the video on demand service nowadays divide the video into two smaller channels, right? So, like uh, YouTube, uh, each of the channels is led by 10 seconds, two seconds, three seconds. But in your analysis, uh, if you choose all the video as a unit of the caching strategy, or are you looking into the smaller channel? Yeah, great point. Um, most of the work that I was showing here was for downloading a complete file. And I uh, absolutely agree with you. It is actually streaming that is of the, uh, of the greatest interest. And we did look somewhat at, uh, at the aspect. Um, you usually want to bring in some form of back pressure scheduling because you uh, might have might have users that are almost at the point of stalling because the playback uh, buffer is empty. So your your scheduling becomes more complicated than uh, what we had here, where we, uh, where we simply said we schedule whatever user has the, uh, the best mode of um, In addition, you also have the challenge that you you can have adaptive video quality. And so you uh, you furthermore now have to basically find a reward function that, uh, that tells you, I have the choice of either sending two chunks of lower quality to these users or one chunk of higher quality to, uh, to that user. And so that trade-off minimizing the stall probability is indeed an interesting question. We have one, uh, one paper on that, but I didn't really discuss it. That is, uh, again, an interesting problem. That's something we haven't really uh, looked at up to now. So it's uh, even when we're looking at the streaming question, our assumption was always once you start uh, looking, uh, once you start watching, you actually got that kind of to do it again. But yes, this is a further effect that should be taken into account. Thank you. Other questions? So when you talk about two clusters and device-to-device communication within the cluster, so how do we ensure the knowledge difference? Does it mean like we can switch from Azure 2.0 to Bluetooth or Zipi or some other technology? Or like how does it mean? Well, the assumption here is typically that we uh, that we just have uh, one single uh, radio access uh, technology. So we didn't really say whether that might be uh, the uh, the device-to-device -device mode, the, the side link of LTE or uh, Wi-Fi director or, or something like that. The, the assumption is just that we have one particular uh, communication link and bandwidth designed for the device-to-device. -device, uh, In that situation, how can we ensure the non-interference with other clusters? 
uh, that would be based on uh, essentially just frequency uh, we use. So just uh, just like in a, a cellular system, you you have the the non-interference between between cells by uh, by having a frequency you use cluster. You would you would do the same thing here. So you say you're using every frequency only every third cluster or every seventh uh, uh, cluster, which of course decreases overall your throughput, although it doesn't impact the, uh, the, the scaling laws. Uh, of the frequency we use is Yeah. Are there other questions? Let's thank the speaker once again.